I like this conversation. So. <laughs> maybe you want. Maybe you would like to repeat what you just said, Joachim. Again, just, yeah. just real, just really quick from the oh, flow. Okay. Part. Yeah. Maybe the flow diagram. Yeah, I can go yeah, over yeah, that yeah. again. Um, so, it. Um, this is a it's a diagram I developed a while back called "Working in the Flow," and uh, just to keep uh, that short here. So you see this uh, green like flame thing in the center, which is where you actually work. So this is your typical daily workflow pattern. So here's where you narrate your work, where um, you uh, post stuff to you know different places you go to, different communities, collectives where you're a member of, right? um, ask questions, uh, receive updates, and write other short blog posts. So really your day-to-day -day activities is right here, sort of swimming in this activity stream, right? So everything that we do today is, is really more like a stream uh, being being part of a stream you know i call it actually in the morning i go swimming into the stream and i jump into the stream do that for an hour or two right and then uh are up to date with all of the activities and conversations around me right so this is this is a flow very very you know uh process that's that's it's very uh fluid so you don't have to go somewhere else and stop sort of interrupt your thinking um and this is what i mean by uh stuff that's above the flow so if this green stuff is in the flow, there's stuff that's above the flow. And then examples are uh, you want to publish some content, right? How do you do that? You have to go to some website, log into that website, create an article, you know, register that, preview that, and then and push it out to production. Um, or you have to fill out some forms somewhere, right? Or you have to go look for information. You have to find the right people. You have to understand the issues first. So this is stuff that's kind of above the flow. So that sort of stops your current thinking, and then you have to, Go think, okay, what do I have to fill out? Where do I have to go? Who do I have to find and talk to? Um, that's kind of holding you back and pushes you out of the flow, right? Versus the green stuff is, is meant to keep you in the flow, keep you working where you are. Um, and then there's also stuff that's hidden from flow. So hidden from flow at the bottom here is stuff that you put away in information silos, you know, in some repositories that are hard to access. Um, that you don't have an act in the link to what's, uh, you don't know where it actually is located. Um, or it's hidden in email change, so it's changed. So you talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with people, um, typically in a corporation, you talk, you know, email via your boss. So these are very vertical streams. Um, uh, they're not horizontal. They don't cut across a lot of people. They just cut across a few people. This is typically when you have these command and, uh, you know, um, resolve chains where, you um, uh, you have to report to your boss or something, right? So you keep these emails, limiting that to the people involved. Um, so this is all hidden, really, from from the activity. It's hidden from the flow. Um, so that's the dark stuff here at the bottom. Um, and coming back to this uh, stuff in the center here, so we talked about how can we bring stuff into the center. And, and one way to do that is um, through sort of real-time activities uh, during conversations. So the, the talk time tool that I'm putting together is an example where you actually use that application doing the conversation, doing the meeting, you know, doing the real time thing you're doing, and you update it. Um, and that update can look like, you know, for example, um, this Coggle chart. That's a nice real time thing too, if you can do it during the meeting, right? Um, where you can just add topics, you know, to the meeting and then say, okay, at some point this topic surfaced. You know, we talked about. Um, like in this this chart here, we talked about uh, working in the flow. This topic surfaced. Let's put that into the um, app, right? At that point, and then you can come back later and say, okay, they talked about working in the flow. Let me click on that, and that could actually bring it directly back to the conversation, back to the video clip at that point, right? And then you can go and augment it too if you want to. Some some post processing is possible, right? Um, but I'm sort of uh, seeing, you know, if you could put as much as possible into the real-time situation, into the present moment of the conversation, the better you're off. Um, because very few people go back afterwards and um, do all the uh, refining and cleaning up unless they have a specific task or role to play. Um, so um, that's about uh, the uh, real-time thing. Okay, so I think we're back to <laughs> where we started the conversation and the recording, right? Um, let me stop at this moment here. Uh, you want to hear something else? Let me know. No, that's that's really good, and uh, I think I think um, the idea of being able to work in the flow 
I think is a common thing. You might have heard me talk about that before. I, I talk about working in the flow as well. Um, I didn't know you right. had a whole concept built around it and the context of, of um, separating the things that we could automate, have other people fill out the forms for us, have other people go find out, you know, push the secretary button and those are those things up out of the flow. You delegate those things, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Right. And stuff below are like private things. So when you're able to work in the flow, like uh, I think Harold Jarkey was one of the early tenants of working in the open. Right, working out loud and uh, all the good yeah. stuff that came out on this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this stuff's been going on for a long time. It's really good to see this stuff coming together. And, and my vision of knowledge trails is where you extend these in a, in a longer memory type of way. So if somebody comes and says, I'd like to talk to you about something, I, I know you're interested in X. And so then you could say, well, here's my knowledge trail, right, on that. If you want, I can show you some highlights. But if you if you review this, then you'll be where I am, or could possibly come and bring new things to me. You know, so that way you can go back into your flow, and they can kind of get into your tailwind. I guess you could say. Absolutely, that's cool, Colin. And so the whole concept of knowledge trails. Uh, let me introduce here also the idea uh, of knowledge expeditions. You know, something I've been doing with uh, John Calden and uh, a few others in the past. So this is the idea of um, actually going on a, we call it virtual real expedition into some kind of a problem space. Um, and we actually tie that to uh, the happenings in a real expedition. So when you get together and want to climb, say, Mount Everest, right? So you can create the context of Mount Everest. You'll be there. You can see base camp. You know, as one example of where you start your journey, right? So Basecamp, that's actually, you know, a lot of, you know, tools using that metaphor today. Um, so a space where you get to know each other, right? Where you sort of build up your skill sets and you get the equipment that you need, you know, to make that climb because obviously that's a big thing in front of you. <laughs> and uh, you want to get ready for that, right? So you have Basecamp and then... Um, you can map a lot of this stuff sort of into a virtual real environment. So virtual real means either it's, it's both virtual. So there's a, of course the, the, the uh, digital you know, space that you create there with all the functionality. Um, but it's also real to extend that um, you can, you know, see yourself at base camp, right? You can see yourself shouldering the backpack you can see yourself, you know, talking to each other. Um, and preparing yourself for that journey, right? So it becomes a real thing. And actually, with uh, with uh, the knowledge expeditions, we push that so so almost to the edge. You know, how far can you go with this? And yeah, we actually I see, did. I see that. I see that too. Um, I think of the final edition of the knowledge trails as like a minority report kind of thing, where you know you would have like a, a I guess Corningware had this ad out. Oh, I don't know, four or five years ago. I think it went around the conversation community as well. Um, where Corningware was building these life-size visual displays. So they'd be like right. in your bedroom, on your walls, and just, you know, all over the place. Just So it'd be like, you know, you could turn your bedroom into Mount Everest and invite everybody over for a, <laughs> for a movie or something, you know. So, yeah, that is where it's going. And the virtual reality is, is uh, I guess, becoming more ubiquitous with, with people playing games and things. So... Yeah, I, I can definitely see that expedition. So when you're doing this expedition, um, what are the real-time elements that you're trying to bring in, like uh, building group synergy or what's the, what's the yes. AR aspect? Of that? That's right, that's right. So this is a very you know, human-centric approach, um, meaning we're not there to sort of go, get into a, a video game where you have a task and then you shoot some monsters or you reach that top and you're done right this is much more about uh, building connectivity understanding the others in that space you know feeling that they're there too and this is where i see a lot of overlap um to you know the the uh, gcc experiments right now happening you know it's it's really about the human connectivity um there's a term called uh, subjective in, you know intersubjective uh in, in action um so this is where you enacting yourself you know you're projecting yourself into that space as the person you are not as someone else right not as someone you know who puts up a mask 
and says, okay, here's, here's me, you know, a different person. I want to pretend to be, you know, that, that person that I'm not. Um, no, this is, this is really about yourself. This is you, just like you, Colin, being in that GCC conversation, sitting there talking about your real issues, right? Um, you're muted. That's actually a good thing most of the time. Um, Intersubjugation, what did you call that? Um, let, me, let me see if I can uh, show you that in the chart because it's a fairly complex um, concept. It's a big word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the, um, I was also going to mention that with the GCC, um, it, is, it is a human element and looking for ways that people who have a difficulty get into a common flow with people. They have different flows and they don't, how do you, how do you adjust their flows so that they can harmoniously work together or resolve something? It's kind of mm -hmm. in, in the visual aspect of what you have. How do you bring flows together, I guess, without causing um, sparks and, and uh, fuses blowing and, you know, um, and I think as well, there was something else I wanted to say about working in the flow, but it's gone by. Maybe if I rewind. We'll come back. <laughs> yeah. Come back. Um, so this, this is a two by two, a simple square that, uh, you know, you've probably seen, you know, something similar like that before. It breaks it down into me, you know, a me and a we. So this is me, myself here, and internal and external, right? So this is uh, me, you know, looking inwards, and this is uh, me uh, projecting outwards. Um, and obviously there's uh, the subjective part here with uh, me, you know, thinking about myself and, uh, you know, my identity, who I am. And then there's uh, the objective part, which is uh, the thing that other people see outside, right? This is you, you participating in some conversation, right? Um, so that's normal stuff. But the interesting stuff gets, gets, into, uh, gets, gets here into, into the we space, right? So the internal we space where there's something called intersubjectivity, um, or senius. Um, that's a term that uh, Brian Eno coined. Uh, that's um, a musician in, in the UK who uh, came up with that concept of what happens if you put people together in a room and they suddenly begin to interact, right? Um, and not just the, the visual interaction, you know, between people standing there, but also, you know, sort of the thoughts and the thinking that begin to overlap when they do this. And something new kind of arises out of this uh, that uh, we call social field um, when we're doing these expeditions. So it's, it's okay. something. So that sort of is like if you did get different people to put their flows together, you get this kind of a, a flux form called the sinus or being in the scene. Exactly. Scene. That's right. Being... Yes. Yeah, so you get this glow. <laughs> yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In the scene, in the scene, exactly. Um, so in that, in that, that coin, I, the term I'm I use. I'm sorry, uh, is that just like vibe, like the vibe of the room? Vibe could be a good, good term. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's a good term. You know, there are different ways to, to, to really try to explain that concept um, because it's, it's so, so not physical. It's not, not uh, what you have in, in this space over here, external and we, right? We get into the the social interaction, right? So here's the conversation. Here's uh, the feedback loops, right? Here's uh, the the cybernetic stuff where you know you hear, you receive, and then there's a sender and receiver and all the good stuff, right? This is more like, as you said, like vibe. Um, but there's something else at play. Um, that's a really strange sort of effect on on the group. Um, and you know, I have just have a place already here called social feel. That that's really happened doing these knowledge expeditions and when we sort of climbed up to Mount Everest, you know, camp one, camp two, camp three over a couple of days, after a while you get this sense of, well, there's something else in between us, right? Yeah. Why are we doing your brain, that? Your brain fills it in like, uh, like in, in uh, the experiments where they put like a, a, a shape behind Swiss cheese screen and you can fill in the blanks of the shape and behind the screen, your brain will fill in the spaces that you can't see. Uh -huh. Square or whatever behind this social field, um, it could also be on a spectrum because it goes all mm -hmm. the way from uh, a, you know what you saw in the in the states when they were all protesting that uh, I can't remember it was just terrible. It's like the mob they had with all the tiki torches. That's a that's a negative social field. Right, Charlottesville. Yeah, Charlottesville. Yeah, and then you can have very positive social fields like um, 
you know, some of the revivals you see people go to or, or concerts and things. Yeah. Or climbing Mount Everest with a group of people you trust, I guess. Absolutely. That's very iconic. Um, so just to wrap this up here. Uh, so this term I used is called inactive intersubjectivity. Um, there's a person um, called Hannah Diega. Um, and uh, she's, she's a scientist, I think, in, in, in some Italian university. And she's written a lot of articles about that. Um, what that actually is, this interactive, uh, inactive intersubjectivity. You know, that feeling that you have among others creating this uh, thing called social field and then enacting that, you know, bringing that to the surface and sort of embody that. Um, and Doug talks a lot about that too at the GCC. So the embodiment of your inaction, right? So you being there taking these senses that you have because of others in that same space, you know, out there and begin to enact that uh, in a space. Um, and, and the funny thing is this is all happening in a virtual space, right? And that's where you actually blur the lines between what's, what's virtual, what's real, you know, um, where, where you, you know, start to create these, uh, these, these senses and the, the interactions, right? Um, while you're not actually physically present, you know, with others in the same room, you're not, right? But you still can have that same response, right? You still can get to that intersubjective, you know, in action in these virtual spaces. So that's one of the, you know, key things I wanted to explore more with these knowledge expeditions, right? How far can you actually push this? And then not only that, um, there's a whole research around um, putting people into flow states, right? So what happens if your brain sort of aligns, and that happens sort of automatically, it's built into the brain, right? As soon as you have people starting to co cohere and to, to sense this field, um, your brain waves sort of align with each other, and then it gets you into this, uh, what's called a flow state. Um, so flow state is something that um, sort of, I don't know, you know, I had that, you know, maybe a handful of times in, before I started this, um, we get into a state where everything drops off around you. You're so focused, yet not, you know, it's not, you know, expensive in terms of, you know, to think a lot. It's, it's, it's very relaxing, you know, and, and you, you can get done a lot of stuff, you know, in a very short amount of time. And you're just there and you're very present in that moment, right? So that's kind of the flow state. Um, yeah, Me? Colin? Yeah, well, I think when you're actually um, learning something uh, in, in a course, a lecture, or maybe taking in a tutorial, learning programming languages, I experienced that, where you're deeply involved in, in, in the flow of that learning a language or something. So um, very much, you can, you can get into that flow state in hours can go by so you have to be careful you need to get a timer, <laughs> get a timer on the flow state <laughs> I think well, you, you get isn't that's right isn't time management rule number one here to even it's, have a flow <laughs> it's true it's true but at the same time colin you get into you know there's two 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 senses of time right there's chronos and there's kairos right so chronos is the you know chronological you know tick 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 you know minute by minute time flows by versus kairos is when you this other zone where time doesn't play that significant role anymore, right? Where you feel like it, it took me hours and it was only minutes, you know, kind of thing. Um, and that kind of space, you can put your brain into that zoom, right? That's the fascinating part. Um, that's, not, that's not the same thing as wondering what day it is, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It can, it can only be so... Um, so with the knowledge expeditions, it puts you sort of into that flow state for... Uh, a short period of time but the funny thing is it sort of keeps you in that elevated state um after even after that you know expedition is over right like an inertia sort of like a state it, inertia. that's right i think so you know something you know is happening there and your brain actually keeps that preserves that state for a while and it drops off and you're back to normal again right um so so that to me is uh, why i'm doing some of this stuff here is really to get into that state of mind and to bring others into that same state right because then something, you know, magical happens, you know. Well, I'll let Lauren get in here, but that just, again, reminds me to your expeditions are kind of like going through an orientation with the way I see the quest game that I made where you can, you know, pick up the flow of people around you because you are working intentionally in the open 
focused on what it is you want mm. to give or would like to receive and and making those short little presentations and in the beginning state of the flow like working in that state and then i say you know would you please give me that post once you're done instead mm. of instead of playing around on facebook and you know entertaining ourselves if you really have something to say can you send me something well mm. if you don't have anything could you write me a quick post that's what i did with the three or four gentlemen who were very excited and active on my threads but weren't actually contributing a lot to the flow in fact they were pulling out of the flow they're causing negative flow backflow mm. <laughs> so um so i find that there's some very common ideas that we have that's very interesting and i think it's i think it's all just looking towards effective intention you know because there's only so much time and we have to learn to talk together effectively and be able that's to remember it. what we said and be able to you know increase the size of the flow pipe really that's that's right. that's really a con exactly right and i i know um lauren you had that question too um when you joined that gcc group or john Keldon stuff right? what are you guys doing here you know what is this about um what are you building you know and to me you know what colin just said is at the core of it right so enable people to get into that flow state uh, to actually have real conversations real dialogue um that's just a precursor to say from there we can do whatever we want to do right that's an enabler. It's not about solving one specific problem here. It's just enabling that we can do this. And uh, we just need to be ready to get to that state. And that's not easy, obviously. You can see this from numerous conversations that we that's have all over the place. GCC calls that fertile soil, once we have the fertile soil. So, yes. And, then, you know, uh, and, and it's so confusing when you can't visualize the flow because different people see a different flow. Yes, and, right. And it is amazing. And some people think, you know, the GCC actually has a steering wheel and a charter and a cash box and a pizza day. It's just, it's, it's, it's not that kind of a thing. It's an experiment where you try to resonate your flows, really. Yes, and, that's right. And, and including everybody so that, you know, I think that's some of the, mis the, the, the disservice or maybe just it takes a long time to get the quality into the system, but having the right onboarding so that people can find their flow in a way that they're not contrived like you were saying you know, about um you know bringing your authentic self and mm. you can't bring unless it's your map that you're filling in while other people are helping you you know it's um it's not authentic so when other people are trying to arm wrestle you their way with their tool that seems to be a very ineffective way to um try to resonate and get, find coherence so yeah, this is this is very exciting. I love it. Right, right. And then and then of course there are the challenges, right? So because you know, if there's a core group of people, you know, 10, 15, 20 people doing that, being inside, being in the moment, right, and experiencing it, right? So you know you have done it and you can talk about it, versus a thousand other people who are sitting around this, looking at this, right, have not experienced it and don't know what that is, right? And then they come up with all kinds of explanations for that, right? Or, or, or what they want to do, the sort of the next reaction is, oh, let's build some structure around that. Um, this, this, what you're doing there is very interesting. We need some structure here, right? Um, so they're starting to, you know, de departmentalize everything and putting, you know, the typical things here. Where, where is the operations team? Where is the marketing department? They're trying, um, to, they're trying to, they're trying to fix it. Fix it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You know, that's the typical reaction you see in that space. So, so the, the GCC stands strong against that. <laughs> well, the core team, yes, and that's that's amazing that uh, they yeah. still. And I saw that in one of the conversations uh, that I watched there is uh, they still preserve that thing that they're building, right? That intangible thing, that really that social field. They protect that, um, which is a very good thing um, because you don't actually know what this is or what it becomes, um, but you know it works because you're there, you're experiencing it in the moment. Um, and what I want to do now, you know, to well, well, sort well, of- Hold on, hold on. The big, oh, yeah. the big frustration is <laughs> those that see it know it could be so much more. And you said that in the last meeting that we the inaugural meeting of the of the uh i don't know what the club's called yet the people forming but um i think you were saying that um along with what yokum was saying i just lost i lost my uh train of thought there uh but this social field 
it's very frustrating when the people don't see the, the amount of talent in the room. And that was the first thing we noticed when we went into this new group, that everybody was very sharp, authentic on their own thing, not really needing to co uh, compete with anybody. And as soon as good ice com ideas came out, it was like it, they just grew branches immediately. And just like everything you yes. planted seemed to grow. It was so exciting. And I haven't watched it yet. And I haven't seen your branches yet, Lauren. So if you can send me the link to your stuff, because it's probably better than my stuff. and we got to integrate the stuff. <laughs> oh, I haven't sent you the notes? You did, but it's like seven, like even from the, even from the request I put out for people to give their like little spiel about what they're in, I only got like three or four and then the meeting happened. And then, so I've been in the Yoakum, the Yoakum uh, drowning in the afterflow. I've been swirling in <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we got to be careful not to swirl in the afterflow because it's, it's a time trap. And, uh, and that is why the maps that I did initially, they're, they're manual, and I knew not to try to perfect them because that's madness. The idea is to try to perfect how to do this in the flow. So I was always thinking this way. Yeah. Exactly right. So, so uh, you know, the more you can introduce into that flow, I think the better off everyone is. Um, and that to me is where it's very important to send these signals out from individuals to the group and the group receiving these signals and doing something about it, right? Um, and so that's one of the ideas for the talk time application is, you know, a simple signal is in a group meeting is uh, how long did someone talk um, who hasn't talked yet. Um, uh, keep some order here to say I raise my hand, you know, so I, I'm, I'm okay and let's, let's just wait until the next one uh, shows up or have, I have a, an interjection, you know, let me say something direct, more directly here. Um, so, so that kind of thing, the administrative pieces here, you know, sort those out so they don't disrupt the meeting too much. That's one part, yeah. You're muted. I'm making all these grunting noises, you can imagine. Um, the, uh, the one feature I never verified with you is does it have the micro format or the format where you know you do check ins and the timings and then the checkouts typical meeting um, during the talk or any of those sections can it just I think obviously it works like probably like this from default somebody can talk but they're not going to get cut off but they will relinquish the floor so that it doesn't break the flow so that it's actually just tracking sort of just tracking how much time it takes not telling them when the time to stop and start but if they're if they're aware of the time then they could say oh i got a couple of minutes left or i got like i'm over two seconds so they self audit themselves don't let the tool actually stop them i think that's important for the first introduction of the tool so that people don't feel like the tool is going to cut them off but Which in the end just... the tool i showed you the talk time tool basically yeah, okay. If you haven't seen it, maybe you want to pop it up there. Yeah. So it, it's I did a, check it out. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's like great cool. So I see that on being on the PC version with the knowledge trail or the you know the little scroll of the what's going on. That's very it's very difficult to do the visualization of the um, Cronus of what was spoken about. Um, you know, and and not fill a large screen like do it on a small screen. So. Um, right, right. Yeah, that's, so that's. I think, I think, I think swiping would be for each person. Maybe each person could have their own like channel, like swipe, 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 swipe. Maybe you could fill up one screen with each person's flow and it could show where it hooks off to other people, but I'm not sure. Right. To me, I think that's, it's like a second screen here. So this is the main screen for just looking at who's talking, right? So you, you can go in here, you can um, uh, raise your hand if you want to. Um, and then it shows up on the um, on the screen. Um, not in this one here. I haven't refreshed my app. <laughs> um, here, let me just. You got here. several versions out there. The one I gave you, Lauren, was very buggy too. So if you're interested, you should probably get a new one from Yoakum. And he sent me. Oh a couple. yeah. Yoakum. Yeah. Oh, here's, here's okay. the, But here's I'm him. sorry. Is this is this going to be an app like Zoom with? Video or no? This is uh, just a participant. In concert. A participant. Yeah. Yeah. So you you use it while you're um, using Zoom or something like that. Yes, it's an adjacent it's a adjacent thing. Um, so you're in the meeting, 
you can have that on a, on a mobile app or it could be on the screen too. So next to the Zoom meeting, like our vision meeting here, next to it is, is this screen here that shows you, okay, here's Jim now, right? Um, raising his hand, right? Um, and then the only thing you do is, okay, it's Jim's turn. You just uh, say, uh, he clicks on this and then now he's talking. You see him talking now with the talk time there. Um, and that tells everyone else. It's just a way to signal everyone, okay, Jim is talking. And if someone else now is in a list here below that and also wants to talk and respond to that, they can do that, right, anytime. It doesn't prevent them, you know, it doesn't control the conversation. You know, it's just a signal um, that something is happening. And then what I wanted to do too here is um, there are situations where it gets very stressful in a conversation, right, especially in GCC conversations. And I want to have a way to say, hey, let me raise that. So there's a button here that says, okay, I feel like uh, this is off topic now, right? So you can see the like in there. This is veering off topic. And the more people who say that, actually there's a signal marker on top. Um, I'm using the, the typical mobile phone signal marker. You're kicked out of the conversation, you're kicked out of the conversation, off topic, off topic. <laughs> boom. <laughs> yeah, but, you gotta have the cliff button, you're 10 seconds from the cliff. <laughs> Right. So, so you can actually, that's right, you can go actually in the latest version here, you can actually click this, uh, there's a long click built into that. And if you do that, um, gosh, I just can't do a talk and do this at the same time. Um, um, now that, that's funny, you can't talk and do talk time at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm talking probably, that's why. Um, where you can actually send out a, uh, a distress signal. So if you feel like, um, yeah, it doesn't respond in this one. Um, if you feel like you're really under stress here and something is happening to you personally, right? Someone has attacked you during the meeting um, or there's a topic that you're really uncomfortable with, that's another signal you can just send out to the group, right? And what I want to do is in these kind of situations is there's a certain protocol you follow, right? So if someone actually does that and initiates this distress signal, um, you expect everyone else to respond to that. So if, if I do that and say, this is really something I'm not comfortable, I can't talk about this right now, I can send out that signal and we can then immediately, again, in the present moment to re try to resolve that situation or push it out you know, in a one-on-one -on -one or do something else with it. But we're aware of that and that's important because these signals get lost very often, right? Um, you can see that someone is in a distressful situation. If you don't have sort of the EQ, right? If you don't have um, a way to sense uh, the empathy here in the room, it's difficult to capture that right and this just makes it a lot more explicit to say hey this is happening here guys let's take some action this is this is almost an emergency right um and we need to do something about it because it can get you know you don't have to un don't underestimate how, how stressful this can be for some people right um i've been on knowledge expeditions where people almost freaked out right they couldn't take it anymore i mean for almost like a physical sense of you know, this, this is something I have to get out of here, you know, or, or they, you know, lost temper or whatever. You know, it, it does happen. Your mind is sometimes, is, is oftentimes not prepared for these kind of situations, right? So all I want to put into this app is to say an easy way to amplify that signal back to the team, right? Say, hey, here's a problem. Guys, watch out. Let's do something about it. Resolve it. And it's... Since you push and to me, very important to keep the core here, right? This is about the conversation. That's the work, David White, right? Um, let's let's augment that and and make that piece uh, more stable uh, and help people to get through that and make them stronger. Uh, and create some amplification loops to, to actually improve these conversations and get into this flow state, get into a coherent state where everybody can achieve what they wanted to achieve, right, together. You know, it's a we space. It's not a me space presenting there. And I, I mean, of course, Lauren, you know, if you have a bunch of people uh, with, with, with astounding ideas, right, in a room, they go off in separate tracks very quickly, right? Um, they want to realize the ideas, they want to utilize them on the thinking of the others, you know, and get their idea done, right? Um, but to say I'm stepping back here and say, okay, 
this is actually we, something we need to work on together, right? So slow down, folks, right? Um, and see where we can go from here yes, uh, right there. rather than pushing it on. Yeah. Don't mind me interrupting. Um, that's where I felt being ready and having someone already see your, your knowledge trail, you know, um, a bit so that when you do come to that, what I call space gravity, you're calling it uh, flow senius, senius? Mm -hmm. senius, I'm calling it space gravity, but I think senius is better. <laughs> Seeing as it comes from a good source, I like the source. So if it means the same thing, why use two words, right? Space gravity kind of sounds kind of Star Trek y anyway. Um, so when you do come to that space, um, you're ready to maximize what it is you have to offer in that room because I find not only do people with a lot to express that haven't expressed it before want to get it out, um, which you have to get through somehow, which I'm thinking that's, that's homework somewhat, you know, introduce some of these are my links, you know, if you're interested in what I'm doing. And I think the right thing you can do if you're truly ready is put out a, a little video about what it is, and, you know, you have presentation. So these are, this is nothing new, the, the more, the who documents. So I think having people to help you document your idea and present it to others, that's that supporting. Um, you might not really be interested in what that person's doing specifically, but you are interested in that person and they're, they're, you're reviewing their book. You're helping them translate it or whatever. They'll help you um, document your stuff. And, and at a meta level, the same thing, when you're trying to track the conversations, if people kind of had their space, their flow space, that their, you know, their direction, Hmm. You've already you already have it kind of skeletoned out. It's really easy to see, you know, like busy bees working on their particular part of the, and you know what they're doing and why they're over there, and because you can visualize what they're doing. Um, in the maps, so you're just, you're kind of just continuing a con what's that's what the definition of a conversation is actually. You're you're actually having a conversation with that person over a longer period of time. And that means you don't come into it fresh every time. Reset. That's like that reset is a horrible pet peeve of mine. True, and, true. And they do it in government all the time. Like I don't <laughs> understand how all of a sudden four years went by. We'll just take all this work, which I don't think that's exactly how it works, but you know, we'll just ditch these bills and we'll start from scratch again. It's like <laughs> <laughs> we're still on the savannah here like what's going on that's so that's a very important topic too you know the two things you brought up now colin um one is uh, sort of governing a group of people to actually moving towards some common goal and the other one is is seeing that something's evolving something is being built together um you know, let me show you real quick um sorry about all these visuals here um the stuff i'm doing with the digital life collective um Here's kind of um, the uh, home, I call it way station for the Dig Life Collective. Because from here you go into all these different areas of uh, the Digital Life Collective. But uh, the thing I wanted to show you here is that I also put in a, a holonic map to actually show everyone um, what's currently happening in the collective. Um, so this is uh, just a visualization of the different activity spaces that are you know, around um, the Dig Life Collective. So there's uh, ecosystem maps, there's, there's a, the home domain here, there's operations, there's projects down here. And you can, you can zoom in into any of those and see, okay, operations, there's a big sysadmin group, you know, there's a tech upkeep group. Um, and you can click on those, you can see who's in that group. Um, and uh, you can dive into that and jump actually into the, into the conversation, right, and see what is happening here. And you can go, you know, as many levels deep if, you know, as you want to. So this, this whole thing is extremely organic, right? So it grows by the participation of the people who are actually sitting in there. Um, there's this color coding to you, meaning the bright white means uh, there's active conversation. There's people sitting there and having, you know, minute by minute conversation. And there are circles that are fading out too, right? So those are uh, things that like operations calendar we might have started and not continued, you know, or conversation shifts into other spaces. Um, so these are, again, sort of signals I'm throwing back at the collective to say, 
hey, uh, what's currently happening, right? So give me the big picture and then f so I can find sort of my space. Logan, here. I can I'm find sorry. Where I'm, I, yeah. Is this, is this software that you're using or is this your graphic conception of what could be? The software I'm using. Um, the software what I've, software I've, is this? Um, so I've built that um, in, uh, there's, a, there's a library called D3. Um, it's a visualization library for all kinds of charts, right? And I'm hooking that into um, sort of a JavaScript front end. Um, so I've written that in Vue 2 here, just like the, the talk time app is a, is a Vue, Vue JS app. Um, this one is the same thing here um, with uh, some different modules for different components. Um, and we're using this actively at the collective, right? So you can go, every one of the members here, if I click on this, you can actually see um, here the members um, of the collective and uh, you can see how they're connected. Um, so if they share some of their profiles, right? Um, what are they working on? Where am I? Oh, here, up here, right? So I'm sharing my profile here. What I'm doing for the collective is around branding, design, governance, KM, knowledge management stuff. Um, and you can see, you know, sort of they're beginning to weave their work together, right? They see where they are and uh, who the others are in that space. So all part of building this trusted space and part of what Colin said earlier, right, is, is you want to see how that thing grows, right? You want to see there's some people joined, you know, the dotted lines, for example, just joined here. Um, you want to pull them into um, the activities, right? Make sure they become part of it. Um, and help and help grow this thing, whatever it is, and it, it's it's organic because you know it grows, but it also shrinks, right? So if participation goes back, you know, less less uh, activity in these spaces, they disappear, right? Which is which is natural, kind of it happens, right? You don't want to have a you know a static structure here in big boxes, right? And put people into the boxes, right? That's kind of the old thinking. We want to move away from that to a much more organic model where you can find your own role, you know, your, your, your idea of where your interests and, you know, skill sets are um, and find your calling in this, in this space and then go do something, right? And if you feel that's too much or you, you know, under too much time constraint, you can pull out, right? Um, so it's really very fluent, you know, you move in and move out into, into these spaces. Now we need the mixing board. We need the mixing <laughs> board. We need the... Uh... We need the we need the we need the gravitational hotspots. We need uh, you know the ones that float up like probes. We need uh, you know Z. We need the Z axis now. You got the Y axis. <laughs> Ron Ron actually has done that. Uh, I don't know. Have you seen his drawing? Um, Ron Scroggin, um, who was part of the knowledge expeditions. Uh, he is there. Um, he he has these yeah, cool drawings. Fun. Yeah. Um, he goes on to these. Um, he's a oh, I call oh, him. Glenn would love this stuff too. Like. Glenn, Glenn would just, yeah, because he's, oh, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's into this fractal view. So it's one thing to dream it. It's another thing to actually see it. And it's frustrating when you want it and you don't have it. <laughs> I know. Um, so, so back to where we started with this conversation, right? So I can see there's a lot of overlap, you know, similar activities happening across these different spaces where we all want the same thing here, you know? break out of the current context, you know, do something new or we get into some kind of a flow state, more coherence, right? So we can actually get stuff done. Um, and this is, this is all new, you know, this is, you know, creating these, these things, these tool sets, these protocols for these we spaces is, is, is a new thing, right? And it's hard because a lot of people don't have that mindset shift done, you know, they, they are still sitting on the other side of the fence where it's all about competition and, um, extraction right and when do we when do we make profit you know when do we man, make money out of this you know um versus over here it's a different kind of mindset where it's more about you bring your skill sets to the table you build some collective some community something that moves towards something you know together in this we space so so the conversation is is the work piece you know the the process doing that together is is what what's really counting here not the product at the end so much. I mean, the product, yes, um, it's important, but to me it's like a side effect, right? Say something like talk time, if that becomes a product, well, so be it, uh, that's cool. Um, and I want to push it out, you know, and give it to other folks that can utilize it in their own conversations, right, as much as possible. But, but, but only in the sense of, you know, reverting this, you know, seeing that there's some feedback coming back, you know, there's 
some use cases out there where it really applied, which I haven't even thought about. But this whole notion of you know, adapting something, adopting it to your needs, and then also finding the exaptation of that thing is, is a fascinating aspect to me. Yeah, I was uh, thinking as well about the pro version, right? How you take the cog to it, like, you know, Yes. Yeah. These cognitive tools. That's so important, you know, um, looking at the cognitive skill sets and, uh, and noticing them, realizing them and feeding them back to a group of people. You know, it's, it's a learning process and it takes, it takes time, you know, until you get to that state. Um, you've experienced that with the GCC. Right? I've done it in, in other communities. It just takes time. Um, but it's a rewarding journey to me. It's, uh, that's where our future lies. When, <laughs> if you read an article like Eumor Higgs, you know, talk, discussion about climate uh, you know, change that, that's coming up, it's scary stuff, right? So you have to sort of start getting prepared for serious conversations, right? Um, but not too serious, right? Where you like panic and whoa, you freeze and nothing happens. It's, it's this strange space where it's, it's a playful space, but it's serious play, right? So true, so true. And, and to get somebody yeah. to want to play with you without the right tools, it's hard. And Lauren is yeah. actually um, doing that. Amanda's doing that. There's, I see other people, are, weavers are starting to um, find people. And maybe it's just probably more to the fact me just waking up to the thousands and thousands of other little ecosystems that are out there. <laughs> exactly. So, oh, they find you. Know, you, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well it's, sort of like, it's sort of like a, a coherence, a resonance. And um, yeah, you, you, you have to be authentic and you have to... Um, be willing to help people and not competing. That is a big, big part of it. And that's why we're talking about the pro tool. So you give the free tool out and then, you know, you make money off of the, that's what I think. Um, there's also some other ideas that if you, um, you can meter the usage. That's another thing where they pay a little bit per month, but not to get into these low level conversations. There's also, once the data is hauled into your knowledge bank, you can meter it out like, you know, the credit card companies, penny for penny. So Facebook isn't using you as a, as a free raw re material resource anymore. They're, they're paying you for your good stuff now, right? I th think that's, that's the idea. <laughs> so it's so of, scary. I mean, you know, Facebook coming along with their own opening your own bank, right? And then they're here, bam, yeah, yeah. on the stage. Not only the bank, but before that, they are playing the cognitive gift be get, um, game because they realized that they wanted to predict what you wanted to buy to sell that information. You know, you should make more of these and target that person. But then they decided, well, if I nudge them with this and I nudge them with that, then it's filling in a couple of those variables in their flow. So I can guarantee a lot more that well, they're actually manipulating in, in the S by pushing you a certain way. And then they have a better confidence on what you're going to do. And if you play that backwards, they just, they just, um, brainwashed you a little bit right i mean yeah that's of course that's that's the game they play um and uh luckily you know a lot of people finding out that game and uh trying to begin to see some countermeasures with the banking thing in facebook that's even more scary to me you know that gets into your wallet now this is where it gets really personal right where they can really hold your attention right hey <laughs> you better do something about it i mean this is this is such a scary shit um so, so, you know, we're sitting here, you know, um, people like you guys and, and John, you know, trying to break out of this framework. How do you do that, right? Um, how do you break off this mothership there um, and, uh, and not, you know, get sucked into that, uh, that black hole? It's really, really hard. Um, the understanding is there. I think the components are coming together as we see it, right? So the pieces are, are becoming more obvious. Um, and luckily also, you know, these big, platforms are built on a very fragile, um, you know, intention, you know, if, if sort of if the appetizer wouldn't be there anymore, what happens, you know, they can, they can crumble, you know, it's not that they have a solid 
foundation that they stand on for years and decades to come, right? And not to think. It's like, it's like you always think that, I remember when I thought MySpace was something amazing. Like, my what? My yes, MySpace. right. The name yeah. was right, but the time was wrong. <laughs> and this and, and face, face thing will have its time too. So, and talk time's on its way to help us find the flow. So there you go. <laughs> So what I was wondering is, uh, where are we at with the social ledger, and can we start to use it, even if it's uh, not perfect, to kind of record what we're doing? Um, where are we? Yeah, so that's yeah, that's a good question, Lauren. So, so social ledger, you know, there was an initial version one that uh, was sort of embedded in a Mattermost um, tool very command line centric. So you have to type in team member, adding that member, adding a, uh, an asset, adding a document to that repository. People didn't like it. Um, you know, just learning, you know, a few simple commands goes way beyond, goes above the flow, really, right? It's not what you want to do. So, so that's why I've been rethinking that whole concept of social ledger and moved into a sort of a, a version, next generation social ledger that's more graphic, more visual, more point and click stuff that people are more familiar with, easier to get into. Um, so what I'm doing there now, and, and part of that you saw actually with the Holonic chart and the network graph um, from uh, Dig Life, that's sort of building, slowly building the context, um, building the right environment uh, for the social ledger to happen, right? It's not the social ledger itself yet, but it's the environment, the pieces, the different moving pieces um, that uh, enable the social ledger. Um, and from there, let me see if I have a quick chart on that. Um, um, it becomes sort of more of a, a platform we're putting together for the social ledger. Once, once we have some of the moving places uh, built out, um, then the application of the social ledger would become much more obvious. Um, and to me, you know, it breaks down into certain elements um, that need to be in place for this to be enabled. And, and you know, simple one here, take, just take one here of this chart, the conversational elements here. Um, there is, uh, John, John Calvin recently coined the term programmable chat. I, I love that. So it's not the simple chat. It's, no, you have to see it as a programmable thing. Actually, stuff can happen inside these chats. You know, you can pull in other conversations. You can pull in bots into the conversation. They can analyze what's happening there. You can have applications hooked in with these called web hooks into these chat rooms, um, where you can actually enable a whole bunch of other functionality within these chat spaces. So this is a really big space happening right now um, as part of one of the uh, what I call conversational elements. The other one is um, the thing I'm doing now, the meetings and the feedback loops. So that's this part of the stuff like tech, um, like the talk time thing, and also looking at some video conferencing solutions beyond Zoom. Um, we're looking at another one that's actually open source. So it's called Big Blue Button. Um, that uh, uh, is, is open source, is free. Uh, so you have to pay for the server resources to admit, to, to keep it running. Um, but it has at par functionality and breaks you free from these uh, hosting licenses that you see. And it'll, I mean, that's typical stuff that is, decent, is centralized and it gets expensive very quickly. You know, you, there's so many software as a service, these SaaS solutions out there. Um, they're nice, they're free at the beginning, but as soon as you have more, more people on board, they get very expensive. And that's the intention really behind that. So with this platform, this is more of a meta platform where I see, um, different pieces, you know, filling out these spaces that are mostly open source. Um, and uh, we do want to support these folks too in the future. So once we have a significant amount of people using that, we want to get into a conversation with these open source folks to say, hey, you're building a great tool for, for note taking, for example, um, can, we, um, can we help you out? You know, um, can we help you with the funding? Can we help you with uh, developer feedback, uh, with tool sets to you know, have other people use your tools and so forth? Um, so, so once all of this stuff, and, and you know, some of the pieces are, are in place, like the maps and holons, you saw that, um, the skill sets thing, uh, tapping into the potential of, of the participants. There's some labs here and there. Um, and then and John's big piece here is also the card, card uh, based interface and the boards, uh, the cardboards. So John and I, uh, and Colin too, right? We have had you know many, many conversations on 
how to use cards. What is a card? The metaphor of a card and using card games, um, using um, what I, I may have did with um, you know the the methodology cards, right? So helping activate uh, conversations with certain ideas, topics, right? Or, or even getting into um, into a physical card game like you see this one here did that with john a while back too we can actually print this stuff and then use it in um in a location you know meet other people and then um agree on you know what are the cards we're using what's the meaning behind the card and uh, sort of trigger other things um so that's i mean the whole card space is, is huge it's humongous right and you can do so many things uh, in that space so i'm i'm trying to get into that now from the social ledger perspective where um now these cards actually, you know, as a physical card, they're just there. But as a virtual card, as, a, as an element, you can actually do some stuff with it. Um, you can actually do, let me show you that too. You can, I, think, I think that's kind of the idea of the, um, the mind mapping that I'm doing. I'm basically mm -hmm. putting down these um, milestones. And a lot of times they're people and the things that they're doing. And they're, you know, it's kind of a manual version of the whole lunge without writing all the software in the back end. Um, uh -huh. and that's very interesting. I won't interject anymore, but yeah, that's, that, that's. No, that's cool. Thanks, Colin. It's a dialogue here, right? <laughs> the, the one that I have, uh, now for the meetings that we're starting to get into there, I've gone to the card format and that's one thing that John wanted as well is the ability to, you know, he said programmable conversations. Well, it's like programmable coherence almost you know so uh -huh. yeah uh -huh. that's i that's, guess that's, that's the idea the social charts are made yep that's that's the space you get into um so with the cards here right if i you know if i have the card physical card versus a virtual card here on the screen right you can do so much more with it you know you not only you know who actually participated right um in creating this thing you know in that case here it's a, it's a channel, it's an interest channel about mapping and data, you know, that uh, Christina has started a while back. Um, you can see who's interested, what the participation is in that space. Um, you, can, you can go right into the space. Um, so in this case, it's a, an affinity channel for this, this specific topic. Um, it'll take a while to build it here. Um, but you end up back in, in, in a metamost channel and you can continue the conversation right there. Um, so, so that's that's the notion of, of cards, right? And that can be extended into all kinds of directions. Um, here, here's I mentioned um, the uh, the notepads, right? Um, it's another open source tool that's just plugged into this, um, where we can pull in um, quick notes uh, that people create during meetings, you know, doing um, their own personal time, um, and then they share these notes uh, with with other people. And uh, they're very easy to sort of modify, right? So here's a note, for example, I wrote on, on the binder protocol um, from Anders, um, from the uh, Holochain Collective. Um, yeah, I know Anders. Yeah, he's a cool dude too. He yeah. has brilliant ideas. Yes, yes. And he actually, he came up with this idea of a binder protocol and using these kind of cards and notes in a very effective way um, to to build this knowledge base very quickly, rapidly, out of small, piecely, small pieces uh, loosely joined, right, David Weinberger, um, rather than creating monolithic, big um, documents. I know David, too. He's my favorite professor. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's an interesting guy. Uh, so so that, that is another piece here, right, where you plug it in and then you can mix all kinds of media, right? Um, you can write it down on paper and you share that here. Um, and you, you can you build this together. Again, it's a co-creation here, right? So this is something that's, you know, in this case here, you see it's freely accessible. So anyone who has that link, just like a Google Doc, but we're no longer in the Google space here. That's important to know. Um, this is... Uh, owned by the collective right this is open source we own it we own the data it's on our server right nobody can touch that we can talk about anything we want um, i just noticed yeah. as well that i can go in and work on some pages like the one with talk time and stuff but when i go back to the main screen it wants me to join the co-op it says if you're already a member of the um 
the back channel. I forget what it's called. Uh, well, otherwise, you, it would ask you to join, and it asks for a, a, a donation amount and some different things. Maybe you might want to talk about that because if this video gets some some play, I don't know how long we're going on now. I guess we've got maybe about a half an hour left. Uh, you guys can decide what you want, but I think this digi life is quite an uh, interesting thing. Dig, dig life. Right. Lauren, how are you doing on time? I'm free. You're good? Okay. I'm going to go a little bit more. Um, yeah, just a little bit about uh, dig life. Um, I mean, what we're doing there is is still very experimental, right? So um, this is. By the way, I'm a member, and I, I I'm going to Christina's uh, thing every Thursday on uh, knowledge ecology. Awesome. It's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, the thing that Colin saw is actually when you come to this space, it's called a, it's a diglife.coop. You know, if you go to that, um, it asks you to uh, log into you using your username um, that you have in. Um, in Mattermost. Um, so if I log in here, there's uh, notice I'm in here directly, but there's another protection. You know, once you're in there, it checks if you're actually a member in, in Mattermost. So you can get to all of these channels here um, that you see here. Um, but um, so the idea is, you know, there's, there's Dig Life, and we have sort of a mission and vision to sort of improve on the technology. And you can see that with all the different um, interest groups um, that you saw in this uh, card based form. Um, why is it not showing? Um, go from here. Here, uh, you know, it's different in different interest groups and different uh, types of conversations that are happening. So that that's what happens in 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 the digital life collective. But we're becoming more and more of a, a we can call a meta collective. So we're inviting other folks into that same space, but they become like separate entities. Um, so they go in here and um, let me see if I can get into one of them. Um, they set up their own spaces uh, that are independent from um, what we're doing at the Digital Life Collective. Because we recognize that everyone is interested in, you know, um, looking at uh, technology you trust and all of the implications about identity, currencies, and inclusion. And We're all talking that. to Stephen, too. Good, sir. He's brilliant. Oh, Stephen, yeah, he's, he's on there, too, somewhere, right? Um, but you notice here on the left side, so these are, in, in Mattermost, they are called domains here. Um, so we have domains for, um, you know, the main domain, friends, we have operations and uh, project stuff. And uh, we also have uh, these friend domains here. Here's uh, Michael Linton's stuff um, about uh, community currencies. Um, so he wants to build out a whole college around that. Um, there's uh, Christina's stuff, of course, ecosystemic mapping, thinking, systemic thinking. Um, and then um, here's another one from Eric uh, called Open Learning that he recently started. So over time, I see this as a sort of the launching point um, or way station, as I call it. You know, uh, that's a science fiction author who wrote a book about, you know, sort of bringing people, all kinds of people, even aliens, right, to one space, and then they find their way from there. Where else do they want to go? What else do they want to realize? Make make out of this? Find their purpose, right? <laughs> um, so I can see like John Kellen's stuff also popping up at one point here, you know, as, as another entity here. And they're not really part of Dig Life, but they're using their own tool sets, right? So they may use some of the, the tools and, the, and the, the, the notepad, for example, that we're providing out of the box um, as, as a way to enable, again, enable their conversations, right? That's an important piece. So if you go into any of these things here, these teams, you know, these, uh, these uh, collectors will have their own uh, conversation topics, their own idea of how to move their conversation forward, right? We want to, we don't want to control this. We want to just say, here's some tools that help you uh, get uh, better connected, you know, accelerate sort of the process here, right? And help you get the right tool sets and the right thinking and, and the right protocols too. You know, that's, that's one important piece to me is um, uh, things like uh, onboarding. So how do you get a large group of people into a virtual space, right? Um, what, what, what's the best way to do that? Uh, the, you... the, herding, the herding cats problem, right? <laughs> That's right, exactly. Uh, and of course, you know, a lot of folks have, have you know, tried that and have different ideas on how to do that. Works easy, it's always easy at the beginning, right? A lot of excitement and things are happening. Um, but once you're in this uh, for a while, then it, uh, it's getting more and more difficult. 
So, so I think I think the I think the I think the trick is is in the affinity or the coherence and that magic flow that you find between common people. Because at the GCC, they have a thing where it's more of a lobby or a base camp, and then you know you see people suiting up, and where did they go? Oh well, I don't know. They went somewhere, else, you know. So you there's no guarantee that things are going to happen there, but it's definitely it happens within that virtual seniors like it's up there and it's a bit frustrating because from the outside it looks like they're just coming to an appointment right like a right. time right. Right. and then the people who want to steer it or use it as their main channel get frustrated because they're trying to the idea is blow a large idea through a straw and like they can talk forever and it's they're not ready they don't have their back channel or their, their, their tail of their knowledge trail for you to catch on to. So that's where, and then what you just said right there, that's the flower or the, the strange attractor. What keeps these cats coming back? Like, you know, if you have like a barn in cows, you know, you, you put out the milk and the cats, you know, it's warm in the barn. So all the cats come to the barn. <laughs> so you, you need the whole ecosystem. What was the video I just watched? Um, the Serengeti effect. Has anybody seen that one? Where... Well, the idea just quickly was it was an ecosystem and they, the ecosystem was, was failing somewhat. And in the, the, the punchline is, is they lost the lawnmowers. So once they brought back the wildebeest in larger numbers, they would mow the grass and then there'd be less fires and then the saplings would grow instead of burning. And then it just, the ecosystem would thrive. So yes. that was the keystone species that was missing. So anyway, there's there's the ecosystem with all this stuff, and and I think I saw the one with the wolves. It was the same concept. Yeah, yeah, he mentioned that too. Yeah, with the with the uh, Yellowstone Park. In Yellowstone, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. yeah, and you know, it was missing a predator, and there was that a whack, and 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 the other one was using pesticides on uh, rice bugs, and what it did is it killed the spiders that ate the rice bugs, and the rice bugs were immune, so they they flourished, so they ate more rice. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, that's, that's I right. Think I think all these analogies are important in this herding cats and um, it is, visualizing you know, it is. what's in front of you. Right. And right. also, I noticed you got a socio-cultural elements down in the bottom left. Or right. 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 Uh -huh. There was one of them missing when I was here last time. Is which one did you add? Education. That's no. right. You got it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm following Good. along. I, yeah. I yeah. I plugged in the other one um, since you brought it up, uh, Colin. It's a uh, sort of tapping into local communities and ecosystem. Um, that's I'm calling this anchoring down here, right? So this anchoring up means uh, reaching out to uh, your ideas, you know, realizing things, you know, putting it out there um, on the visual surface, right? But on the other side, you also have to anchor it down, you know, to anchor it into, you know, something like um, warm data, you know, Nora Bateson. Uh, or um, you know, anchoring it into local communities that work where actually is happening, you know, right there with other people. Um, did you get that? Did you get that idea from our conversation with uh, Olivier? Because he's all about the local, like local. So, that's right. Yeah. And he, yeah, so into yeah, very good. That's a good term too, right? Um, and you know, a lot of these pieces sort of anchoring this down and making sure that actually is sustainable. It stays there. It's there in ten years from now, right? So that is an important part of this platform. Um, not only the stuff that's going out there, you know, and building new, new, new and uh, attracting other people, but then capturing all that knowledge and, and your trails too, right? Colin, um, you know, making that something as a, as a long-term memory of this platform, right? So others can find it and not repeating everything again, you know, reinventing the wheels, right? And, and doing that. Um, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. How do you create a long-term memory? And I yeah. guess, well, Something that's different from just having documents, because no one actually goes and looks at the documents. <laughs> I, I was thinking that the trails part, just to put in quick, the, that, that's the programmatic piece, that um, even the more dynamic piece uh, down at the end, where you don't want to see every conversation you ever had. You want to see the conversations that relate to what you're doing today, and it's Sunday, right? So you don't want all the, the news. You want your Sunday things. So we've talked about that too as well with John Keldon having what I was introducing is the idea of a, of a knowledge butler. So some of the stuff that I want, we can't have it until we actually build in that, that ontology context map and 
and uh, dynamic retrieval and the most beautiful part, the visualization so that you can actually interact with it. And I think yeah. that's the flower. The, instead of like Joachim was saying, they don't want to come in and fill out a form and three, three buttons. They want to be way down the road on their flow. <laughs> so. That's it. That's it. To, to me, you know, going back to the, you know, so the, the idea of uh, building organizational memory and um, spaces that uh, can preserve a lot of the activities that are happening. Um, going back to, you know, putting stuff into the flow, right? So here, here's, here's a card, for example, on uh, collective intelligence. You know, I've been editing this card uh, with a few others for quite some time now. So it's just repeatedly coming back to um, this, this idea of, you know, in this case, you know, building some kind of a collective intelligence for the uh, people involved in this. Um, and you refine it over time. And that to me is uh, what I call a social object. So a social object is something that can be taken out of this fast flowing stream that we find ourselves in, you know, the chat conversations that are floating by so quickly, ideas are just gone in minutes and you can't find them anymore, right? You have to have some pieces that are flowing much slower, right? Sort of, sort of grounded, embedded in the river, right? And that to me is, uh, takes shape, is, 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 is what I call a social object. Um, let me see, I'll just, opened another thing here just by coincidence um, around um, you know creating these social objects um, in in these spaces what, what does that mean to create something like an attractor for a space you know to have people come back to actually continue working on um, the stuff that they've building on working on together um, sorry this is this is loading a bit slow I hope I'm still there. <laughs> By the way, I talk to uh, Michael Lynn a lot. I really like him. Yeah, he's a very interesting, you know, he, he's, his, his knowledge on currencies and, and bringing that into communities is astounding. Um, yeah, it really is. Yeah, super modest there. Okay, this is slow, slow, slowly loading. Um, is that Jim know. from uh, Urchain? That's right, yeah. Okay. That's, uh, Jim Weitzgaber, one of the early founders of the internet. He's like a founding father, um, creating the very first protocols, you know, to get all this. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. Also, uh, I'm on the heels of Tim Berners-Lee, um, working on the Solid Project. Uh, and uh, there's also um, um, what was I going to say? It, it doesn't matter. Go on. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, that's, that's astounding, the people you meet in these spaces, right? And uh, you keep meeting, I mean, that's, that's interesting, because they had these ideas many, many years back, and now some of this stuff can be implemented, some of this can be realized, right? Um, so they're coming back into these conversations from all sides. Um, but again, the challenge for us here is to say, okay, let's uh, align us, you know, let's, let's get behind these ideas, you know, some of the stuff, you know, Sam, Sam is um, sort of the... Uh, the keeper of uh, the knowledge of Doug Engelbart, right? Um, he's like preserving that. And of course, he totally of course, is. <laughs> he's like one of the few people who were there, right? And um, we don't want to lose that knowledge, for God's sake, right? It's just unbelievable. And he is one of the few who really understood um, Doug's vision there, right? Um, and uh, so, of course, we want to, you know, connect that to what the rest is doing, right? But we're not all at the same level, right? So we're all slowly wandering our knowledge plateaus, right? Our sense-making plateaus and beginning to, you know, reach out to each other, understanding, aligning us, right? Aligning our ideas, seeing what makes sense, what do we move forward, what do we cut off, right? Um, how do we govern this stuff? And that takes time, right? It really takes time and, and patience and uh, and, uh, and understanding. Um, so, um, where we are, um, social ledger, let's wrap this up, right? <laughs> you had this question. <laughs> um, so, so you saw now the environment I'm building, right? So that's the enablement, uh, this is the card-based interface where you can see there are different activities happening. So the social ledger is, is there actually to record these interactions not the transaction, you know, it's not a commercial transaction between party A and party B, I pay you, you give me this stuff. This is about, I was there, I participated actively in some conversation that related to some social object that related to some value that was created out of this engagement, right? And I just want to record that and say, hey, here's a, here's a place to put that. 
cannot be destructed, but right? it's it's hidden. It's 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 um, part of some um, you know some hollow chain, some some chain um, that's out there um, that you can use as the backend to record it, um, and you can retrieve it, right? Um, and it becomes so much more than just a transaction, right? So transaction is something you know is just lost. You know, you, I give you ten bucks that dollar bill has no indication of why it was transferred to the other person, right? So it's gone. Versus here, I can say, okay, I was there. You know, I was there with Colin. I, you were there, Lauren, at this meeting. You know, that started something. Great, let's record that. And people can come back to that and say, here we are, still here, right? Working on that. Let's connect that. Let's branch it into other things, right? Let's create another knowledge trail from this meeting into other meetings, right? And let's, let's preserve that information, right? That kind of um, trail. Um, but not not in the sense of we want to make money out of this data, right? This is old style thinking. You know, this is we don't want to go that route. This is about feeding that back into the same loop, right? Giving it back to the people to say, hey, we were here. Other people recognize that, and that's actually a good thing, right? That they found us um, and wanted to work with us on certain aspects of this. Great. You know, that's good use. That's relational data. That's this data, the warm data that uh, Nora Bateson is talking about. Not the cold data stuff that says, "Oh, cool, we have some good, you know, data that we could sell to third parties here because they're interested in these kind of technologies we're talking about." Right? That's yeah. I've I've read on uh, one data. Right, right. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's I think where we are with with that stuff. Um, where else do you want to take it? So how how far along are you with these social objects? Is it just in the beginning phase, or do you have something that can help uh, people manage projects with that? Or uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the idea of mimetic currencies, which are kind of these um, uh, ideas that can take root like trees and just kind of grow, and people can put their resources into these ideas and they, they they have kind of their own structure of managing resources and um, infrastructure within them. So it sounds like that's a, like a mimetic currency is a lot like a social oh, object. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. That's interesting. That reminds me of a project I built a few years ago where you would have a grid of the people involved and you, you in this one, the the input data was from the members themselves by just saying, you know, I want to give this person's, you know, they helped me out, I want to acknowledge that. But ideally, if you could plug in their contributions and have them weighted, then it would be that kind of a grid so that if $10,000 get, did get donated to the project, all of a sudden, you know where the money goes, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it, so what? I, how I see these, is currencies, high velocity currencies that can fly around um, the internet and all the chains like magic carpets that can, something that goes in between different applications and platforms and uh, things like that. So you have, they're not like stable currencies, um, but much faster and they behave more like means. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good aspect of that, Lauren. And to me, currencies need to also be circular. You know, that's something that uh, Michael Linton's talking a lot about. Always, um, yes. <laughs> our, today's currency, you know, these, these hard currencies we have, they're just, they're gone, they're linear, right? Um, you pay and they, they, they leave the system, they leave the collective, they leave whatever you're building there. Versus what he's talking about is, uh, well, it can actually be kept and reused. And then um, it's just a matter of, um, um, you know, Tiberius is talking about that this contribution accounting system, right? You give something, you receive something, and you have some other ones who, you know, pay back. And then it balances itself out. It stays within the, With the, the collective. Sorica? And across. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that guy. Um, fascinating stuff, um, and it, it goes across collectives too, right? So if we agree that we're using the same currency, or we have an exchange rate between these currencies, we know what the value is. That's great, you know. That is all staying inside the circle. It's, it's like a life currency. It's something that's 
alive because we keep it alive because of the activities because of the things we're doing we're building we're sharing among each other um rather than the other sort of dead currency right it's flowing out and you still have to pay your bills of course um and then you have to reserve a certain portion for that um to to do that and pay for the infrastructure cost um but a lot of the other stuff can be shifted into into the circular thinking of uh, keeping currencies alive. I think that um, also yeah, this, in the in the circular currency, any any resources and money that you could attract because it's circular, it can circulate again and again and again within the community. So the impact could be a lot stronger. Say if you were getting a grant or something like that, I think the impact could be ten times stronger using a circular currency yes absolutely right can accelerate can be you know can become stronger than um it was usually when it was when you just exchange it when it went through this uh kind of uh he calls it osmosis process you know going from hard currency to this um community or circular currency so i'm sure but, you know uh david right both david boville and chris david boville yeah on, right yeah they're both working on um kind of the legal structure behind this to make it actually happen and i think that's a, they're fascinating but these i think they know each other and um I don't know. yeah I, yeah i'm very interested in developing that yeah he's like um sort of um how do you fund these things and then quickly establish them to make them independent entities right and also entities that are, have legal rights out there so a simple way to create a, an organization right using some of the basic tools legal tools that we already have at our disposal um that's because you do have to sort of anchor it into the current um you know economic structure you can't break it off completely from that right wouldn't wouldn't work um so his thinking is you know how do you fit that into this existing um environment um and that's an important piece of course to um uh it's but still to me it's like uh still that's edge cases that's something that's to be developed um we haven't run into you know the the ideal case yet what what what's that shape what's even what what form is that is it a b corp is it a, a co-op what we're we doing with dig life you know what works you know that what organizational form works that straddles both you know these spaces that we're building um all to be to be determined you know it's very exciting Great question <laughs> and it's very interesting that the default is to just say you're an individual because that's where sam has to set on that you know like that conversation at the gcc it's almost um it's almost a a, a pet conversation you know who are we um because they know they're alive they can see themselves in the mirror but they just can't they don't know their name <laughs> it's kind of it's an interesting thing um yeah, um, you guys are going so fast. I got to get my little Mark and Park going so we can go back to the things. Like, we need the tool. I can't take it. <laughs> I don't want to go back and do any more note taking. <laughs> so, another interesting oh, thing is that uh, I think that um, yeah, I just had a conversation with uh, David Benjamin, who's doing Bridget. I don't know if you know of that project. But it's basically he was working on, I think, I think it's a browser or a browser extension, but it's all about building bridges between ideas and it's linking ideas that have some kind of relationship, which is, I'm not sure if that's similar to what solid is doing, but it, with the bridges, you can actually you can set the bridge you can have different bridges like this information needs to go before that information or this information is basically similar or identical or um if they're opposites or something like that. so you can set the bridge between the information but that way you have an incredible network of um these bridges that you've made and i think in the future the the value of a company is going to be based on, or an organization is going to be based on these bridges that they make. That's kind of like the signature of what they would own or what they would work for. Is these how how 
how they're conceptualizing the linking between different ideas. Mm. Yeah, that's. Can you imagine? Can you imagine with that, the ability to link up all of these ideas and form bridges along with the knowledge trails? That would be pretty amazing. Right, right. The, so it, it it is it is important work um, because this is the anchoring down. You know, this is to say what it actually the um, the structures, the data structures we're using, we, we commonly apply across all these activities, and it's hard work. Um, this is where you get into the dreaded T word, the right? taxonomies, um, where you have to have an agreement on what these terms mean, right? And they mean different things for different people. And it's, it's a never-ending journey. You know, there, there's so much effort has been spent on, on standardizing these taxonomies, right? Uh, coming up with some meaningful ontologies on top of that. It's really hard work, you know. I'm, I'm a happy camper now at anchoring up, you know, and building these user interfaces on top. But I know there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the surface to say, how do you connect all of these into meaningful data exchanges, right? Exactly, yeah. And, 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 the, and reform the context within the flow. As well. And how do you get funding for that? Because you know, <laughs> Yes, right. I know. <laughs> I know, I know. This is where you have these big consortiums, you know, that start starting to, you know, standardize a lot of these data sets. But then you also have the big players coming into these consortiums, right? There's Google who want to do it, Amazon who want to, you know, define that, that, these standards. That, as, as well, the RD, the, the solid project you mentioned, um, that is a way of, of unhooking yourself from the old protocols of using web pages to get at your data, where they use a different way to um, address the data in private pods. And, you know, you can, through a RDF statement, say, I would like to put my comment from my pod on Yoakum's picture in his pod. So it doesn't belong at an address at Facebook. So you see, and then that object, you could say, or connection or data graph can be rebuilt. So it all comes down in the end of these data graphs and taxonomies, ontologies. And that's where I'm working with these guys with solid and stuff. So yeah, so that's and and I'm having fun doing the front end stuff. And you know, I'm jealous. I want to work with this D3. I've been playing with it for years and stuff. But if I had a chance to stand on the shoulders of people who have put this seniors together, then maybe I'm halfway there. See, so if all they want is ten dollars for me to join, that's too easy, right? <laughs> that's free. I'll send you I've already done right it. There. I've already done it. I'm already there. I'm probably one of those dots just like floating out there. Right. Uh, that's, that's, there's more to be determined in that space. Okay. Um, I got to take my dog out here. We have a dog um, that uh, we take care of for a couple of days, and I think he needs to go out for a run. Um, oh, wonderful. A lot covered here. I think I think you have a, a product demo if you only had a product. <laughs> it should generate interest. I think it was a, a lively talk. Um, exercise in listening. Appreciate it. Um, I definitely have a lot larger knowledge. I was floating around these things, but there's until you actually get plugged into the flow, you don't really see it. And so, you know, this can save people time. This is part of the knowledge trail, right? Mm -hmm. So just mark and park the places where I'm talking too much and we got something. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, delete them, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know where to go from here, but I guess we'll be talking on the back channel.